Все, все. Can you hear me? Um, I think it's a big room, so maybe I'll talk with the mic. Um, yeah, this is a really nostalgia experience for me because uh, my first job, uh, I worked for nine years in the American Library system, uh, USIA, not the CIA. Uh, some people can't, can't see the difference. Um, and in three years for the corporate library at British Petroleum. And I can tell you my best job in life was being a librarian. Uh, everything else was downhill from there. <laughs> Except now, uh, because I, I consider actually I'm a digital creator, and you know I feel it's a pretty much an equivalent of being a librarian. Um, but I have to fund my own job, and that's not so not so easy all the time. But anyway, so uh, I'm really happy to uh, uh, to talk to librarians. As far as I'm concerned, you're the the last bulwark to save uh, civilization. Uh, and um, so uh, I, I want to introduce to you. Uh, Peer to peer dynamics and uh, free culture and open source. Um, and I'd like to start with a concrete example. Uh, these are farmers, gentlemen farmers, chemists, engineers, and they have a really crazy subversive idea. They think that if you put good nutrients in the soil, you'll have good food. It may not sound very radical to you, but this is the radical opposite of industrial agriculture, where you deplete the soil and you put it full of toxics, right? So these people, with the simple premise of good nutrients make good food, can get any funding. Uh, you, you can easily imagine Monsanto is not going to give them money uh, to do that kind of research. And actually neither the government, because if you look at the investment in renewables, and maybe Denmark is one of the best countries in the world, but really on a global scale, you know, you're talking about two, three percent subsidies to organic agriculture, renewable energy, as opposed to 97 percent subsidies, which goes to toxic, soil depleting, biospheric destruction kind of technologies, right? So what do you do if you're in that position? Well, the thing is that what you can do today is you create your own network, right? They create their own peer-to-peer -peer scientific network. And they basically distribute research amongst themselves, and they share the knowledge of everything they find. So why is this interesting? Because this is something that was very, very hard to do 20 years ago. Yes, the multinationals would have that, but if you were an ordinary farmer, you know, you could talk to your neighbors, but it was very, very difficult to do this kind of stuff. And so this is really uh, something that I think is really enabled uh, to the leverage of the internet works that we have today, that these kinds of projects to make a really smart, organic agriculture. And you know, these guys have their own technology. They use Arduino. I don't know if you're familiar with Arduino, which is a shared design-based motherboard. So it's the stuff you put in the computer, right? And so there's a worldwide community of... Uh, hardware developers sharing design uh, and then making these motherboards that called Arduino and many communities have their own specialized applications they take the Arduino which is like for everybody but then they make a special one for the gardening and so for example you can use Arduino uh, to you know to use technology on a you know, peer-to-peer level if you do this kind of cooperative agriculture now, let's assume you want to do this, you know, in any field. Well, what are the consequences? Now, if you want to share and build knowledge, what do you need? Well, the first condition is you need open input, right? If you don't have open input, how can you work together? If you don't have free information to share, you cannot. You cannot work. So that means what is out? Copyright is out. Patents are out. Because these are all basically legal technologies which makes it illegal for you to share without either asking permission or paying. So if you just want to work together and have scientific advances, you actually you know, need to do away with certain of these things that hamper. Uh, the, there's another dynamic here. Let's assume that uh, okay, you make advances collectively in this community and somebody would say, 
oh, I'm going to patent it for myself. What would happen? Well, what would happen is immediately 99% of the other people would stop working, right? Because they, you don't want to work. It's, it's okay to work for free in a community if everybody shares and the benefits. But if you are working your ass off and then somebody says it's mine and takes it away, then of course you're going to feel cheated, right? So another consequence is that you also need a particular type of output, right? And so these communities are using a new type of property which I call peer property. Uh, so the general public license, which is the open source of free software, there's a lot of discussion about these two terms, so I, but I won't uh, annoy you with that. But, so the free software licenses basically is the same principle, right? The idea is if you work together on open knowledge, shared code, or shared design, we need to protect the common work. And therefore, we're going to use a type of licenses which protect the common work, right? It's a consequence of wanting to work in a certain way together. Now, what is it? So we have a few, de a few definitions. The first definition is the way I use peer-to-peer -peer as a social dynamic, the ability of people to congregate, aggregate together to create common value to work together to make something, which can be Linux, the operating system, which can be Wikipedia, the encyclopedia, which can be an open source car project, which can be making the Arduino shared design. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer is the relational dynamic. It's, you know, you, so basically, if you look at the kind of uh, relational grammar of it, is you are contributing to a whole and you get back the profit from the whole, right? So you give a brick and you get a house. Now, the advantage of working in the material sphere with knowledge is that it's not scarce, you can copy it very easily, and therefore you actually don't need to worry about the allocation, right? You don't need to worry who gets what. So actually you can say, don't give a brick and you still get a house, right? Uh, every, anybody can use a Wikipedia, even if you don't contribute to Wikipedia, and everybody can use Linux even if you don't contribute to Linux because it's an abundant resource and you can do that. It's of course different once you go to the physical world, you need different rules. Um, so peer production is the specific uh, process whereby people actually create value together. Peer property is the forms of property <coughs> and common ownership that you need to protect the common work from private appropriation. And peer governance is the type of management you require. Now, the type of management, again, it's very easy to explain in terms of the dynamics. If we are volunteering, contributing to a, com a common project, uh, can you boss me around if you don't pay me? Well, the answer is no, you cannot boss me around because I'm here voluntarily and you are there voluntarily. Therefore, we are going to find new ways of managing the community that are based on uh, something different than a command and control hierarchy. There are still hierarchies in these communities, but they're not command and control hierarchies. Right? If you look at, take the Wikipedia, there is a Wikimedia Foundation, but there's nobody in the Wikimedia Foundation telling people what to write. Right? The hierarchy in Wikipedia are the admins and the editor deciding the quality of the articles, and it's a very controversial process actually, so there's a lot of fighting around that in, in the Wikipedia, but the, but the difference is these people are not telling you what to do, right? So the governance models are quite different, this is what we call uh, peer governance. And so if we think about free culture, basically, uh, you know, it's, it's a combination of these value systems that come from our condition as knowledge workers wanting to build and share knowledge together. Because that's what peer-to-peer -peer is, that's what open culture is, that's what free culture is. If you are a knowledge worker, which I think you all are as librarians, right? You want to work that way. You want to share your advances with other people. And you need to know what other people are doing in order to advance yourself. And so from all of that comes these movements like the free culture movement, which is basically acquiescing the fact that if we want to work together, we need to relax artificial scarcities on knowledge share, right? Because if you look at the state of the world today, 
or make a very simplistic but I think true analysis. What, what are we doing wrong? It's not difficult. You don't need to be a rocket scientist. We have an infinite growth system within a finite natural environment. So we are based in the material sphere on pseudo-abundance, a false sense of abundance, that we can take everything from nature, waste it, put toxics back, and nothing will go wrong. Right? And we know that's not true. So today we're using one and a half times the planet already. And uh, the Greens are recalculating now the, uh, the use of the resources of the planet. So in other words, if the BRIC countries and China and everything uh, reach our level, it's no longer four or five planets we're talking about. We're actually talking in eight planets. And we don't have that. Anyway, that's one problem, right? The other problem is artificial scarcity in the immaterial field. We think that people born to innovation uh, won't create knowledge if you cannot protect intellectual property. That's the main <coughs> belief of our system today, right? And therefore, we have mechanisms that make it illegal to share. That's what it is. That's what copyright is about. That, that is what uh, IP is about, patents are about. It's to protect the investment of the people who have done the work as a theory, and therefore other people cannot freely share uh, uh, this kind of work. Right? This is the kind of main idea that, that we have about how it should be happening. But a lot of people, more and more people, I would say, are thinking in a different way. They are thinking that this artificial scarcity should be relaxed. And, you know, and they have this discussion. You have the abolitionist, which says zero copyright. You could say that's the extreme. On one, and then you have other people who say, no, we just need to relax back to the situation where it was 25 years ago. You know, with 20 years copyright instead of 90 years, that would be fine. Uh, and, you know, they're backed up by studies showing that you get benefit from copyright for 14 years and then it's really finished. Uh, for example, the extent, there was a study on the extension of copyright to 90 years, which was just voted by the EU. And the result was that 98% of that income will go to the corporations. Uh, ask yourself the questions, how many people make a living from publishing books in Denmark? Five? Ten? Twenty? Maximum? Right? So imagine for these twenty people, you have a system which obliges everybody else not to share. Right? This is really the issue. And can we not find other ways to compensate authors and creators that do not involve putting young people and even old people in jail and, and slashing them with millions of dollars in compensation. As you know, this is happening in the United States on a regular basis. Um, example, somebody who has Disney on the wall yeah, in, a, in a kindergarten, they get attacked through the legal system. Uh, some old lady would put a happy birthday song with a three-year-old uh, daughter. Happy birthday is copyrighted. You can't, you can't do that. You get, the, you get legal attacks on those types of sharing because of this type of legislation. So that's the kind of general idea. Um, so I want to make a number of fairly strong statements about uh, the potential of these new technologies and the new ways of working that I just showed through the agricultural project of Nutrient Dense. And um, basically, one of the things I maintain is the following. We are going through the third revolution in human productivity. The first one is the invention of coercion. Right? When we go out of the tribal age and we invent slavery and serfdom, uh, people start conquering other countries and people that work for you are basically the slaves. This is the first revolution in human productivity. Right? That's how we build the kingdoms and the empires and the temples and the royal palaces and, and, and everything. It's based on coercive labor. Negative, extrinsic motivation, right? If you don't work, they cut your hand off, or something like that. What's, what's the, big, the second big revolution in human productivity? It's capitalism. Capitalism does something, adds something to that. It says that we can exchange equivalent value. In other words, we can do it out of self-interest, right? So the second revolution in productivity is when we start saying, well, we can work for ourselves, I'll do labor and you get me a wage, or I make a product and I sell it for money and then I can buy something else with it. So, so the theory 
of capitalism is a theory of self-interest based motivation, but it's still extrinsic, right? You are doing things because you get rewarded. Now in these systems that we are going to and that are already working in the Wikipedia and in many other uh, fields like free software, why are people working? Why are people working on Wikipedia? Why are people working on Linux if they don't get paid by IBM or Red Hat? Well, the way the hackers say it is to scratch my itch. In other words, they have a problem and they want to solve it. And so they look at the code and then they correct the code so that they can use it for their own purposes, right? So the motivation is intrinsic. Now, I'm sure you know this, that take three people. And one, people is a, one person is a slave. Yeah? And you take the policeman away. Is it going to work? Well, the answer is no. Then you take a second person and you don't pay him his wage. Is it going to work? Well, actually, the figures are one out of five would still work. So one out of five people in the average corporation is actually self-motivated. So they're actually doing... And I'm actually sure in, in the library field that it's much higher, right? You are a really motivated, passionate bunch. And God, you are lucky to have a, a wage, that I tell you. Uh, you know, if you can do what you like and you get paid for it, uh, believe me, that's a very privileged position, but how many people have that, right? Now, the third modality is where you have a system where you can send out signals of what's needed and people can freely contribute to a common project out of their own intrinsic motivation. And that motivation can be very, very varied. It can be, I want to build my reputation. I want to learn. I want to create a community. I want to create a certain object, like Universal Encyclopedia. So the motivations can vary, but the, but the common point is it comes from you. And so the revolution is today that we can build very complex, very productive uh, knowledge systems. But, and I will explain to you how it's related to actually physical systems that are based on intrinsic motivation and they are hyper productive. I'll take you an example. So, you know, IBM used to do its own development, you know, and build its own software, and it was proprietary software, right? And they would pay, and they would they had a huge administration to, to, for the quality control. And the problem was, of course, that every big company had to do the same. And we were actually building the same internal software, and we were wasting a lot of money doing all the same things. So when they discovered Linux, and it was mature enough that they could say, oh, this could work for us, a lot of companies started moving towards using Linux as their own software, right? So they started using free software instead of proprietary software. Now what happens if a company like IBM wants to use Linux and wants to use its own processes to make Linux? What, what do you think happens? It doesn't work. They are 100 times slower in developing software than an open source community. So IBM pays the people, but basically says you follow the Linux rules and the Linux quality controls, and you follow the strategic direction of the Linux Foundation. And of course, they direct people a bit. You know, they say we should be working on this and this and that, but they don't use their own command and control hierarchy for the people collaborating with Linux because it doesn't work. <coughs> and uh, I, I just give you an example, and I, I heard it also exists in Denmark. So this is kind of an application that you, do, you know young people use, and you go in a, in a party, and you basically just point your mobile phone, and it will share the mu your music list and the pictures, and you know, and just based kind of a, some, some kind of collective algorithm. Well, I I saw a similar system in uh, in Holland made by a few people. I think it was called Roomware. It took them six weeks. How long do you think Philips would work to make something like that? It would take them two, three years. Seriously. You know, with, with the kind of bureaucratic things that are in place in most institutions today, they cannot compete with this new modality of producing highly complex, not just immaterial things like software, but now designs to make things. So, and this is a, a point that I want to make. Anything that needs to be made, needs to be designed, right? 
You have to think about it first. And there's no difference in collaborating on software and collaborating on design. You need a network, you need computers, you need human brains, you need educated people, yes. But it's basically the same principle, right? So this is why we are moving now from open software to open designs. And I'll give you just two examples to show you how, difficult, how, how important it is not just to solve the issues of immaterial cooperation, but actually to solve the problem of material sustainability, of uh, how we're making things today. And I'll just give you one example. There is a, a light bulb, I think it's in Philadelphia, that has been burning since 1903. Um, so this means that we can make light bulbs that can last, what, 106 years. Now, I will ask you, can you find those light, light bulbs on the market? You can. And why is that? Well, the fact is, and I say this, you know, I've been in business for 30 years. I've been an entrepreneur. So I'm saying this out of full knowledge of my own sins. Uh, that as a for-profit, if you do innovation, you want to maintain market scarcity. Right? You're not going to make a fridge that lasts 100 years because you're destroying your market. So the market is fine as a market, you know, scarcity allocation strategy. You know, it works to, so that the right things go to the right people. But it doesn't work so good because it's also, and maybe that's capitalism of the market, as a scarcity engineering strategy, right? When Monsanto makes seeds, terminator seeds, you know about it, right? These are seeds that die off. So that the farmers are always obliged to buy new, every year, you know, this goes completely against natural cycles, against the regenerative, the regenerative capacity of life. But why do they do that? Because they want to maintain the scarcity in the market, right? Now imagine that instead of, uh, instead of a for-profit company, you have an open design community designing something. For example, a car. There are 25 open source car projects today. And one of them is already driving in, in Detroit. It's called, um, I forgot what it's called. But it, and it's a crowdsourced design car. It's not fully open design, but it has really you know, big elements of it. Now, would you make, as a community, a car that breaks down after 10 years? Or after five years, like your TVs, right? You know, the, TV, the TVs are designed scientifically to fail concurrently. Every aspect of your TV has to fail in five years. Not just one thing, everything on the TV. Because, of course, if you want only one thing, you can get it repaired, right? So what they do now is that everything breaks at the same time, more or less. So after three times going to the repair shop, you say, okay, I have to change my TV, right? Anyway. But if you're an open design community, you don't have that motivation, right? You scratch your itch. You are there to make the best possible design for whatever it is that you need. This means, and I'm not an anti-capitalist when I'm saying this, because when companies work with open design communities, they have to adapt to the quality and sustainability design of the open design community. Now, I'll give you an example of how it works. So one is a Dutch project called the Common Car. And the Common Car is, has this idea that instead of changing your car, everything is modular, even the skin. Yeah. So, the, uh, I don't know the English word, carrosserie in French, uh, no, the, the outside part of the, of the car. So, the common car, which was slated for 2011, I'm not sure, they, I'm not, I don't think they will be ready, but it's going to be maybe one or two more years. Well, what you do is you go to the garage, and every three years you have a new skin, and it's a biodegradable skin, so it's fully recyclable, right? So, the companies that will work with the common car, if they do, will not work with a non-sustainable design. They will have to work with a sustainable design, just as IBM, when it works with Linux, has to respect and adapt to the cultural norms that have been created by the particular productive community, right? And they have to abide by the licenses and all of that. Another example is how you redesign uh, production processes when you do open design is a finished product called eCars Now. And what they do is they make hybrid uh, conversion designs. So you have a car, petrol-based car, you go to the garage, the mechanic downloads the design for your particular brand, 
and he can, in theory, that's the idea, in two days, you know, like you bring it on Friday, and Monday you have a hybrid car. Now the first design is, is ready, it's called the, it's the Corolla, the Toyota Corolla. Now, but think about the way they've designed the process. So this is not about buying <coughs> one billion dollars to get a patent to have to make a hybrid car. And this is also not about paying another billion dollars to build a mega centralized factory where you need a lot of capital. No. This is a system that, a lot, that really empowers every mechanic to do conversion. Can you imagine the, the jump in productivity that that means? If, if every mechanic in the world can make your car into a hybrid. Now, before you tell me this is utopian, I can tell you that in every city in China today, you can buy an electric car for $3,000. Did you know that? Probably not. Now, this is not exactly open source. This is called Shanzai, but it's illegal open source. So these are people who do usually reverse engineering, which is illegal. You know, they take existing things and then they tinker with it, but they share it amongst their community. So all these people are using platforms. So they're working like open source communities, but they don't use legal licenses. They don't use legal open licenses. They're cheating. Now, the legal open co uh, economy in the United States is now already one-sixth of GDP. There's a report out that says the open content fair use economy in the U.S. is already one-sixth in GDP. But in China, the illegal version is probably 30% of the economy. So, you know, I'm not talking about things like in the future that are just marginal. We're talking about things that are already happening today and are very important. So, okay. Um, does, this, does this apply to libraries? Good question. <laughs> uh, I want to show you a business slide, <clears throat> which is kind of an argument why, why we have to move in that direction. So, it's not very visible, let me put it bigger. Screen. Okay, so what you see is you have uh, two axes, right? Open and closed, meaning open intellectual <coughs> property versus closed uh, intellectual property. And you have give it away for free versus selling it. All right, you get that? So you have four quadrants. So let's take the first one, which is the classic industrial model. The upper right, you are building proprietary intellectual property. You're making into proprietary intellectual property that people need permission or payment in order to use. And you sell it on the market, right? This is the mainstream model today of the cognitive economy. The co cognitive capitalism works that way. But what is, what is the problem? I'm not talking about the ethical problems, right? The ethical problems, for example, in Thailand, 50,000 people died uh, every year because they couldn't afford AIDS medicines, which take about $20 to make, but are sold for $2,000, right? Because of the rent, the intellectual property rent, that is inherent in that, in that method, right? And this is socially something very negative, I believe. But that's another issue. I'm talking about uh, productivity in a more classical way. So let's, let's assume that, and this has happened 10, 15 years ago. I was working in British Petroleum in 90 to 93. This was already happening. So we used to uh, buy our stock data from Reuters, and it was like $30,000 a year. And then you got, you know, all the what you see on TV, all the, you know, the, the, the spreadsheets and stuff, right? Well, about 15 years ago, you know, when the internet started developing, some companies started saying, we'll give you that for free with a 15-minute delay. But if you pay, you can have it in real time. What happens to the, 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 that business model when you do that? It collapses, right? Why would you pay $30,000 if somebody else says it is for free or you pay $6,000 with a 15 minute delay uh, for real time? So the idea is that once, you, and this is a book called Free by Chris Anderson, if you haven't read it, it's a really interesting book explaining why this is happening. You know, a lot of people get angry at him because you see, you know, oh, you want everything for free. That's not what he's saying. He's just explaining why this is happening. And it's happening because digital reproduction 
is has a marginal cost, right? So once you make it, that may be expensive. Making a movie may be expensive. But once something is made, the copying is really free, right? Whether you make one million copies or ten copies, it doesn't really matter. Once the initial investment is done, the reproduction of it is really cheap. So then you get these people uh, doing that. And that basically, that undermines the, the traditional industrial intellectual property system, right? And this is happening on a massive scale in medicines, in many, many fields, there is a really a challenge. Because how can you maintain that? There's only two ways. Legal repression <coughs> or sabotage, right? This is, what it, this is what happened with file sharing, right? You're familiar with the file sharing issues. So what can you do against young people, and even old people, like in Sweden, what was it like 90% of people over 65 download music? So, okay, let's put the grandmother in jail, right? <laughs> so anyway. So what, what are the two strategies you can do against people sharing? Well, first, put them in jail, right? But that's expensive, too. You need a very strong legal apparatus uh, to do that. And the second thing is you sabotage the machinery, right? Which is DRM. Digital rights management is a, is a system that makes computers not do what they're supposed to do, which is share. Right? So, the, uh, so those two strategies are available to protect the first system. But you can see that it's not very interesting. Okay, my name is Bowens, by the way, and uh, one of my ancestors invented the textile machine a machine, long time ago in Bruges. Uh, but what people don't forget is that three of them before him also did it and they were killed. Because the guilds were not happy about textile machines, right? But you cannot keep killing people, right? It's just... Uh, before the French Revolution, this is unbelievable, uh, before the French Revolution, 17,000 people were killed and tortured you know, on the wheel where they break your arms and legs because they used fabrics that were a royal monopoly. So the farmers, you know, they, they wanted certain clothes, but the, the, the royal, the fuel system had these royal monopolies and only this particular company <coughs> could make this particular fabric. They killed 17,000 people, but it didn't work. People kept on sharing. And this is what's happening today, right? Everything the music industry is trying to do is, you know, maybe it's a good idea, but it's not working, right? It's just not working. You, so anyway, that was the first strategy. The second strategy is, <coughs> is the, the one on top left. And that's really what free software and open source is about. Here you, you're, you're making open, non-proprietary design, code, and knowledge. But you sell it. Not necessarily the software itself, but you can sell your labor, right? Developers, uh, software developers, you know, it's a good job. And you look at Linux, 75% of them have a job. I went to Ecuador, 100% of free software developers have a job. I went to India, 100% of free software developers have a job. So this is a good business system. But you're not, you don't get paid a rent, an intellectual property rent, you get paid for your work. And so this economy is based on derivative services. <coughs> Working, performing, teaching, insuring, integrating. That's what the one-sixth economy is about. This is the, so even though the intellectual property is, you don't get paid for, there is actually a vibrant economy that has been developed around it because there's a lot of deriv derivative uh, service that you can sell on the market, right? But the, the point is, of course, that also undermines expensive IP-based products because these people are only paid for their labor, right? So you just pay the work that these people do for you. You don't pay on top, you know, 90% top-up because it's an IP-based secret uh, project. And finally... Uh, you have, and this is also really massive, uh, the sharing economy. A demonetized sharing economy that is, that is quite seriously developing also on a global scale. Think about couch surfing if you have young people maybe do that. My daughter is 23, I have four children, the oldest, and she did a couch surfing trip uh, to Eastern Europe last year. 
so she didn't have enough money to, you know, to go to all the hotels. But the fact that she could lodge for free in all these cities made her uh, trip possible. Now, she still went to the museum, she still had to eat, she still had to invite her, their, their hosts you know, for a free dinner because they gave her free lodging. But the thing is, there is a massive economy out there uh, of uh, asset sharing that is being developed. I don't know if you know the book, What's Mine is Yours, The Rise of Collaborative Consumption. You know, this is kind of the material equivalent of the open source economy. Because what's happening there is instead of sharing ideas and uh, you know, working together on code or design, people are sharing their assets. Okay, why would we do that? Uh, the example that often uh, cited is the following. Who has a black and decker drill? Oh, wow, that's unusual. Because a lot of people have black and decker drills, and they did, they did a, they've done a study that only they use on average one time. Right? One time. Because a lot of people buy them, they don't use them. A lot of people buy them, use them, then they make a mess out of it and say, oh, never again. Uh, and then you have a few do-it-yourself people who, but on average, one time. Take your car. Denmark's probably a good example because you are biking a lot, right? But you, I'm sure you have a car too. So how much time do you actually use your car? So on average, 20% on a global scale. So people use their car as a material asset 20%, right? So that means that there is an enormous amount of idleness, right? Materially wasted infrastructure in our society. And it was very expensive to share before the internet. You know, why, how can you find a person who needs it at a particular time? It's very hard to do. But today, because of these internet systems like Zipcar and bike sharing and car sharing and, and skill sharing, and Black and Decker drill sharing, neighborhood goods, all this stuff. There's a massive economy developing around sharing material assets, right? One more thing, and this is we're going to the hacker things, right? So people are now working on miniaturizing uh, machinery, right? 3D printing, hack labs, personal fabricators, fab labs, the MakerBot, what else? Uh, the multi-machine, there's a whole slew of development out there and the idea is to, to make machinery that can produce locally at low cost. And it's an, it's an adaptable machine. So the thing is, you can, if you combine it with a computer, you download the design and this thing will either layer uh, something in plastic and now they're working with metals. I mean, I'm not so familiar with the detail, technical details. But this is also a huge development, right? Because why do we have peer-to-peer -peer knowledge creation? Because we all have a computer now, right? The computer has been miniaturized to the degree that everybody, at least in the West, uh, I think two billion people worldwide, have access to a computer, right? And so we, we, we actually, back to the 19th century, we're becoming craftspeople again, right? Uh, the industrial working class in Europe is, set, is 23%, in the United States, 17%. Everybody else is either doing knowledge work or services, but the people who do knowledge work, the reason that we can do uh, peer production is because we have access to, to our own means of production, right? We can, act, we can aggregate our efforts because we control our own machinery. So if you imagine that this kind of trend is now moving towards physical, and I'll give you an example how this works. This is called 100K Garages. It's an American network. They have about 100, 120 service points and they have 60,000 designs that you can download and make locally. Uh, so why is all of this interesting? Because we are moving towards a world where, uh, there was a report out last week, so oil is becoming, they expect oil to be 50% more expensive every 10 years from now because of peak oil, because the, most of the cheap oil is already out of the ground, so now it's very hard to get the oil that's remaining. So the, but our whole system is based on cheap energy, right? Even agriculture. Agriculture is based on petroleum-derived products. I used to work for agribusiness in British Petroleum, so I know this quite well. So this whole system is being endangered because of the energy uh, crisis, because of resource depletion in many, many different minerals. And therefore, the combination of global innovation commons, global shared innovation commons, and distributed material infrastructures is going to be the key, in my opinion, 
to get us out of the mess that we're going to in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Right? As all these issues become more and more serious, we need some kind of solution, and that's what I'm doing. With P2P Foundation, is we think that this is really a big part of the search. Uh, how much time do I have? Yes. Um, okay, I want to make a little historical argument here. Um, imagine that you're living at the end of the Roman Empire. Um, and there's also always a moment in the growth of an empire where it becomes too expensive to grow. And so uh, after the, 20, the second and third century, the Roman Empire basically stops growing. So what happens? Uh, where do you get the slaves from? Well, you don't. Because if you want slaves, you have to conquer another country, right? So the slaves becomes more and more, more and more expensive. Where well, you get the gold from, from other countries, but you can't conquer anymore. So the gold supply is diminished. Because you keep spending gold, but you're not getting new gold, right? So the Roman Empire is in crisis. So how do you maintain all these slaves? How do you maintain the borders? You've got to pay people, legionnaires, right? So what happens is, that first of all, the, the, the farmers, the free farmers that still exist in the Roman Empire, start panicking, and they, they look for protection, and they go, you know, they find some lord, and they say, can you protect me? But I'm not a stake. So let's make a deal. I protect you, and you give 50% of, of your production. So that's the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened was that when, when the Germans, maybe you guys, I don't know, the Franks, uh, in my country, I'm from Belgium, so when the Franks would you know, invade uh, Roman cities, what would they do? Well, the first thing they would say is, I don't know how to do it, with a megaphone or something, but anyway, what they would say is, slaves, if we win, you're free. Not because they were against slavery, because they had their own slaves, but you know, as, a, as a tactic, right? So in other words, there was an enormous exodus of slaves out of the Roman productive system. They could no longer maintain it. So what, what does, a, what does a smart slave owner do? Well, what he's going to do is he's going to think, oh, if I free my slaves and make them into serfs, colony, they can work for themselves, they work harder. Instead of 100 supervisors, I need 10. And I'll just ask them for 50% instead of 100%, right? So we had a revolution, if you like, a new mode of production emerging because of two reasons. One was there was a more productive way of doing things. Uh, the serfs were more productive than the slaves because they were self-motivated. The other thing was that it was also actually interesting for the ruling class. So if you were a smart slave owner, you actually would move to this new system. Now what is happening today? Same thing. Today we have 40% of young people in Spain without a job. In France it's 25%. In Malmo, that's not far away from me, right? There was a study that 52% of the people in Malmo are engaged in peer production. Can you believe that? 52% of people are engaged in somehow, in some form of passionate production. So what we have today, we have an exodus out of the wage system. More and more young people are precarious. And at the same time, we have capitalist companies like Google and YouTube and Flickr and Facebook seeing and understanding that this new way of value creation is of interest to them, right? So in other words, what I'm arguing here is that we have the premises for a very fundamental social change because when the old system is getting into crisis and is no longer answering the needs, and this may be far away for you guys in Denmark, maybe, but I think if you're Greek, you already see the situation a little bit different, right? So if the system is no longer providing, no longer has a credible social contract, then people look for alternatives. And by the way, the collaborative consumption, you know, this is what I was just telling about, uh, car sharing, bike sharing, you know when it started? After 2008. It was growing a bit before, but it's really after the crisis of 2008 that Americans started massively using this system. Not because they are idealists, but because they have to. They, no more, they don't have money anymore, right? Their mortgages are, are collapsing. So, so I'm trying to give you a bit of a, an idea of the context 
in which these things which are now emerging may actually become a very important part of the society that, that we are building in the future. And it's already starting now. So I should say a few words about what does it mean for libraries. Uh, and uh, I have a... Um, okay, let, let me quickly just say if you want to know more about this. So we have at the P2P Foundation a knowledge commons. I, I call it a contextopedia with 18,000 articles about open and free participatory commons-oriented human practices in every field of human endeavor. Did you know there was an open yoga, an open Reiki, and an open Ayurveda? Maybe not, but they are, and they do exist, right? Just to give you an example, open yoga, so there's this guy called Vikram, what's his name, uh, Vikram, anyway, hot yoga, I don't know if you heard about it, 30 degrees, you sweat, he patented yoga moves. Yoga, which has been in existence for 10,000 years, 7,000 years, so this person claims he can patent yoga moves. Well, obviously, the other yoga predictioners are not happy about it, right? So the, the open yoga movement is a movement to protect the commons of yoga knowledge against a private appropriation through patenting of uh, Vikram yoga, hot yoga. Just to give you an example, same thing with Reiki. I don't know if you know with Reiki, but it's very simple. Uh, you're sick, okay, you're healed. This is Reiki, essentially. But if you want to do Reiki, <laughs> uh, it's a little, it, I, you know, I, I have friends who do Reiki, and I actually it works sometimes. And but the thing is that if you want to do this, you need to go through a training program that would probably cost you about one hundred thousand dollars, right? And so a lot of people have done it. Say, so why do we have to give all that money? You know, it's artificial because it's not so difficult. So anyway, that's open Reiki. So people want to do Reiki without having to pay. You know, the kind of trademark that is being asked by the official right. Okay. So all of this, what is manufacturing, design, politics, libraries, you can find on the wiki. In the middle, you see here, these are all subject areas. Um, and uh, there's a lot of work in agriculture, etc., uh, etc. Et here are the agriculture and food. Uh, education, learning, energy, media, etc. All right. Um, here is when you can see that I'm a bit nuts. Uh, I have sixty thousand bookmarks. Oops, sorry. Uh, I have. Wait, uh, did I do wrong? So I have sixty thousand plus bookmarks in delicious. I don't know if you're familiar with, with social bookmarking, you should, I guess, as librarians. Uh, but it's very well organized, uh, but you can't really see the right side of the, of the screen. That's a shame. But anyway, so, for example, if you want to find out about what's happening in the library field, uh, I have 201 articles. Whoops. Yeah, now it's all gone. I'm sorry. <laughs> the... The Firefox is gone. But anyway, um, yeah, this is a private, don't look. Uh, this is my working uh, draft, so where I, I put my tasks, anyway. Um, so what I wanted to show is that um, um, there was an article called Are the Libraries the New Hacker Spaces? Right? So the idea is that the libraries could eventually become a player in this constructive construction of knowledge, right? I guess what you, what you guys did in the past was storing knowledge and then giving it out, lending it to people. And of course, that particular role, as you, I'm sure you already know that for 10 years, is endangered through the internet where people have access to a lot of things that, that they don't have to go to libraries anymore, right? But we still need physical infrastructures and virtual infrastructures to enable this kind of knowledge construction to occur, right? What I'm saying is, if 52% of the people in Malmo are doing peer production, it might be a very good idea for libraries to somehow be part of this social shift. That people start thinking, this is an infrastructure where I can go to do better what I'm already doing, to find support, right? To find material support, to find 
physical spaces, because I'm, I'm sure you know about hacker spaces, co-working spaces. People need spaces, right? It's not just about the virtual. People need to meet each other, right? They need to be together, they need to have conferences, they need to have meetings. Uh, they also need to have uh, an, a virtual infrastructure, not, which not everybody can have. And this, I think, is a good argument for libraries. When did the library movement actually start? If I remember it correctly, it was in the 19th century, when the prices of books went down, but they were still very expensive. And the literacy rates were, were not, right? So workers wanted to read, but they couldn't afford it. And so enlightened reformers, like you know, the rich uh, Vanderbilt in the United States, but also the Christian democratic, social Christian, and socialist movements, pushed for public libraries to bridge the gap between expensive knowledge and the growing literacy. I think more or less this is what happened, right? Now, this is the same today. I mean, a lot of people with education and, you know, can have computers, but a lot of people cannot, right? A lot of people cannot, if you, I don't know if it's true in Copenhagen, but in most Western cities, like in Milan, for example, I was there last year, I couldn't find a cyber cafe. Except in the immigrant neighborhoods, right? Where people cannot afford individual computers. So that's where you have to go to find cyber cafes. Okay, and I'll, I'll close with, with an example. This is a French city called um, Brest in Bretagne. Um, and I will just give you an example of an, what I think is an enlightened philosophy for today. <coughs> so what do they do? First of all, they create an infrastructure so that every NGO and every citizen of the city can have access to service space. Right? So all the NGOs can put all their videos on a local YouTube. All the photographers of the region can put their photographs on a local Flickr type of, of application. They have a physical library of machines. So if you're a citizen of Brest, you can actually borrow computers, digital cameras, taping equipment. The city teaches people to do their own production, digital production. So I'll give you one example, and I thought this was really fantastic. So they have these trails, which are, um, uh, not customs as a word, you know, the people who illegally uh, bring stuff uh, that was not allowed. Um, uh, sorry, I'm getting old and making me Alzheimer's. Uh, what's the word? Uh, smugglers, that's it. Okay. So they have these smugglers, smuggling routes from the 19th century and, up, and, and, and later, right? So these are trails, and the, what the commune is doing is they are enabling teams to do, for example, bird taping, oral history, landmark photography, and then they are placing multimedia kiosks around these trails so that tourists can come and have a much more enriched experience, a much more cultural experience than if they wouldn't have that, right? And so what I'm trying to point out is this. This is not the government doing it. This is not the private sector doing it. This is the government, the city, enabling the social production of value. But they are, they are empowering and enabling people to do that, right? And they use the local libraries as a vital force in this policy. This is just an example. This is what I would like to see. As a non-librarian today, I would like libraries, libraries to do that kind of activity, to add value. And it's also a good business proposition. You know, even a neoliberal uh, party can agree with it because you know, that's how Barcelona grew big, right? Barcelona was a dump until some enlightened mayor 30 years ago decided to give free, lo free uh, what do you call it, lo not lodges, uh, free spaces, lofts, to give free love to artists, right? So there was a whole policy in Barcelona of supporting culture to the city government, which eventually made it the world city where everybody wants to go to. Now they have the opposite problem. Everything is too expensive and young people are leaving. Uh, that's a problem you know, with a pure market approach. But anyway, so this is the idea, that libraries could play a vital role in providing the cooperative infrastructure that people need and that not everybody has access to. Right? Because this is equality for people who are in equals, right? 
if you have a good education, money to buy a computer, access to the internet, cognitive skills, you can cooperate easily. But not everybody has that, right? So we need social forces, institutions, that bring people up to the capability or actually them participating in this new social process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, some merit.